the recording is started. So <clears throat> let's begin this class with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we come into your presence. We surrender each of us in your hands, Lord. Father, as we prepare to share on each topic on the Reformers, we pray that you will lead us and guide us and strengthen us. We pray for the good connectivity, good health. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you will enable us to understand that has been shared in the class. And help us to carry that revival fire in us, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, as per last class, we have assigned each topic to some of us in the class. That is starting with Anita, Lubega, Jeffina, Isaac, Roslyn, John Paul, Zelitoli, and those whom I have missed to address. Uh, Y'all can pick the topics from the second list. So these will be the graded assessment for mid for the mid mid midterm exam or mid assessment. So if you can pick your topics, it would be great. For those who have not picked the topics last week, can pick the topics from the second list. Enoch, if you can pick, pick the topic, it would be good. Enoch and Elisha. You can type the person name on the chat so that we can get, get that assigned to you. Or maybe we can do that later also. And we can start with Anita Govekar. If you are ready, you can present your assignment. OK, and you can start with your session. I'll just stop presenting. Ma'am, I didn't make any presentation. I've written it in Word doc, ma'am. OK. Uh, OK, so you would be sharing on George Fox, right? No, no not George Fox. Sorry. You would be sharing on Zurich Reform Under. OK, go ahead. Go ahead and share. Yeah, ma'am, can I share, ma'am? Yes, yes, please. Then uh, I'll be talking on uh, Zwing, uh, Hardwick Zwingli. Uh, he was born on January 1st, 1484. His place was uh, Wildest in the Togenburg, uh, Switzerland. <coughs> he died on October 11, 13, uh, 1531, near Kipu. He was the most important reformer in the Swiss Protestant Reformation. He founded the Swiss Reformed Church and was an important figure in the border reform tradition. And his early life and career, sorry, uh, his early life and career, his father was a village magistrate and his mother was Margaret Milley. Uh, and Zwingli was priest of Wilders and later dean of Wason. Uh, Hardwick went to school at Wason and then Basel, 1494 and 1496, where his master Hendrik Wolfen inspired him to uh, inspired him uh, in him and uh, enthusiasm for music and classics. But his father and uncle uh, want him to uh, pursue the study in theology. In, um, and he went to uh, in university deeply uh, influenced by the lectures of the teacher and reformer Thomas uh, Wittenbach. Uh, he uh, ordained Wittenbach and uh, sorry one second. And uh, sorry, then Zwingli at once began to preach his new conviction apart from topical criticism and of abuses. Uh, he did not first attack traditional positions. Begin, uh, he began content to expound the regular gospel uh, passages. In 1518, uh, despite much opposition, he was appointed people priest at a uh, great minister at Zurich. Uh, the Post gave him little income or official influence out great scope for preaching. 
he commenced the uh, commenced a series of exposition in the new testament and enveloped a by topical application a uh, serious plague in 1519 found him faithful in his ministry and his own illness and recovery followed by his brother's death in 1520 dependent on the spiritual and theological elements in his thinking and teaching that had uh, been overshadowed to some degree by the humanistic in 1520 he secured permission from the city governing council to preach the true divine scriptures and the resulting sermons helped him to steer uh, revolts against fasting and uh, clerical uh, celibacy that initiated the swiss reformation in 1522 Uh, in pursuance of his view of the supremacy of scripture zwingli preached his now famous sermons at the ottenbach convent and despite local opposition to many of his ideas he secured fresh authorization from his bishop to continue preaching a tract on meets and printed version of the ottenbach addresses the clarity and certainty of the word of god appeared in 1522 The year 1523 was a crucial uh, in the Zurich and uh, Reformation in preparation for a um, disputation with the uh, vicar general of uh, continents arranged for January in town hall of Zurich Zwingli published his challenging 67 article his main contentions were adopted by most priests in the district Zwingli was uh, Zwingli and his sorry Successive steps taken in during 1524 and 1525 included the removal of images, the suppression of organ organs, and dissolution of religious houses, the replacement of the mass by simple communion service, the reform of the bap- baptismal office, and the introduction of uh, prophesying or Bible readings, the recognition uh, re- recognition of ministry, and the preparation of a native version of the bible in 1529 zwingli uh, fostered the movement not only by his preaching and influence on the council but also by his various writings example on education on baptism on the lord's supper and especially the comprehensive commentary on true and false religion in 1525 and he was publicly married to anna renhardt on april 2 1524 that's it ma'am thank you thank you anita thank you um who goes next we see lubega okay lubega you have prepared on which topic Yes pastor and the class Hello Yes we can hear you Okay I think I was given to to deal with the Anabaptists is that right Anabaptist yes Okay So let me go uh the Anabaptist the name Anabaptist was not their only name just as christian is uh, not one second one name. second one second please uh, have you created any presentation that you can share it with the class before you could share no i just digital okay. in no worries on your word doc you have it okay yes okay please go ahead please go ahead lubega i was saying the the name anabaptist is not the name they gave themselves just as christian is not our name it was a name their contemporaries gave them but it actually means it comes from two greek words ana and baptismos which really means re baptizers or to do baptism again mm-hmm. to them they believed that they were going to follow the the bible and the preachings of the new testament it was started by a man they call Ulrich Zwingli in 1484 he was born in 1844 and he died in a war in 1531 but they, he didn't start it alone he started it with his counterparts Felix Marzi and Comrade Gibril 
uh, much as the Bapt the Protestants and the Catholics disagreed on everything in life, they on this time agreed to eliminate the Anabaptists. Their philosophy was very simple. They believed that um, infant baptism was not in the Bible, so they wouldn't follow it. They believed that they would only have one baptism, and that was at when a person is an adult and is of age, he can confess with his mouth that. Uh, Christ is a belief, is a, he died for him, and so they fought against infant baptism. Number two, they had a philosophy of saying that the church and the state wouldn't be bedfellows. They believed that the church and the, the state would be separate. This did not go well because in those days in the 16th century, there was what we call the state religion. Anybody in the state was supposed to be following a given region that was either Catholicism or any other. These guys, if they were born in the 19th century, they would be the Mahatma Gandhi. They believed in nonviolence. They said that they would, just as Christ did when he was on earth, they wanted to follow that. So they were believing in non-baptism. I mean, they were believing in nonviolence. But... Um, this guy they call Felix Mars was the first martyr as far as the, the Anabaptists were concerned. He was drained in Limit River in near Lake, in Lake Zurich in Switzerland. As we know that the, these radical reformers started in the town in Zurich, the town which is found in 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 Switzerland. He was martyred there or through drowning. As far as King, Fe King Ferdinand IV was concerned, he called this one the third baptism. <laughs> so they said if they need water that much, they would uh, be drowned, and they called it third baptism. To correct, uh, first baptism was the other one, which the infant baptism. Second was the, the one they called their name, which is anabaptism, which means re-baptism. To them, this was the first. They, they never called it the second, as others called it. And the third was that one of drowning. So he died on the 20, on the 15th of January, 1951, in the presence of his mother and brother, who told him that he can do anything, but he would not refute Jesus Christ. When they were drowning him, he had Psalms 31, verse 5, to say that in in thy hand I commit my, my soul. And some say that these were the very words that were spoken by Jesus Christ. They also believed that the people were supposed to be priests for themselves. They needed no go way between. They, need, they never needed a mediator. Just as the priests, you know, the priests have that way of them coming and they, you, you, you confess your sins. And when they forgive you, maybe they tell you to read the rosary or what. For them, they believed that everybody would go to Christ and they would ask for forgiveness from God by themselves. I think today I'm not the only one who has got to, something to say. That's what I had to put together. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Lupika, for sharing the inputs. Thank you so much. Um, I also see on the chat, uh, Enoch has posted a message. Enoch, you can share next week, but then you can choose a topic from the second list. If you can choose a topic for now, there you can prepare and share it next or the next class. Next class, if you can choose anyone, George Fox or the First Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, any of them from the list. And you can share about them in the next class. Okay. Thank Hello, you, good Rebecca. Good morning. Man. Good morning. Yep. Uh, please, I'm very, very sorry. I won't be able to meet up today because I'm going out. I'm leaving the city. Uh, my flight yes, is yes. at 7 o'clock. So uh -huh. I don't know. No problem. Uh, my, my topic, I'm not getting my topic yet. Okay, okay. So um, you can take up, uh, you can take up uh, George Fox and the Quakers for next class. Okay. Then I will be seeing. 
Is that okay, Enoch? Or you can uh, you can talk about First Great Awakening or Jonathan Edwards, any of them from the slide that you see on your screen. Oh, okay, there's no problem. I will do that next class. I, I will do so, that. So, uh, so yeah. So, can we uh, decide? Is it George Fox or First Great George, Awakening? George Fox. George Fox will be okay for me. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you so much. Thank I you. may be going the next off class. as soon as I as soon as I board it. No. I'll be going off. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, the next person is Jeffina. Uh, okay. So, Jeffina, you would be sharing on William Tyndale. Do you have a PowerPoint presentation to share? Yes, Pastor. Okay. Yes, I can stop sharing and you can go ahead. Yes, you can present it. Can you hear me, Pastor? So I just want to thank Pastor Diana for giving me this opportunity because I learned a lot uh, from William Tindall. Uh, since Bible is very common today, we have different versions, different uh, translations, and a lot of things. Bible is very common today. I think we have uh, lost the value of it because it's very common. Every Christian home has a Bible. I wonder how many of us take and read it. But once during the time of William Tyndale, actually there was no Bible in English. Uh, so William has this great passion that he wants this Bible to be for everyone. Because he has read the scriptures, he knew Latin. So let me give a little introduction about his childhood. Uh, he was in west of Britain. And one of the things that is uh, very important about William is he learned Latin uh, during his school days. So the Bible was only in Latin. So he read all these Bible and he was like so passionate about scriptures. So what he did was uh, he wanted to study theology because of his passion. But the thing is, even in theology college, they didn't teach scriptures. They taught something else, but they didn't teach each and every single scriptures because there was no translation, obviously. So he studied in Oxford University. Uh, one thing that motivated him was while he was in college, Erasmus printed the Greek Bible for the very first time. So he was very, very passionate about scripture. So he learned the Greek and he wanted to know about this whole Bible thing and everything. So the Bible was only in Latin because it is one of church trick. Because the bishop and the pastors, they don't want people to know what's in the Bible. So that people will start questioning them. People will be like, what? The Bible says this, why are you doing that? So they don't want people to be acute. If they start getting acute, the whole church will be a controversy because the bishop were not exactly doing what the Bible says. They had their own rules and own things. So uh, William came to know about this. But, so he wanted people to know the scripture. He wanted people to live life just like how Jesus said. So, but, uh, so one thing that he thought, were, thought of doing was, first, let me go to the bishop. Let me do it by authority. Let me ask the permission and let me start translating in English so that everyone can read the Bible. So that was his passion. So he went to the bishop uh, who was named Stamzu. Uh, so he went to London and met uh, this bishop and he was like, uh, Bishop, I want to translate this whole Bible. Uh, I, have, I know Greek. I want to translate this in English. Uh, but the bishop was like, no, no, you should not because it was one of church tricks. So obviously the bishop don't want him to do that. And the punishment for translating Bible was really hard to get in. It is actually imprisonment for life or else they'll get burnt just for translating. Even if you translate one single sentence, you will be burnt forever. So this was the punishment. But William Tender had this great passion 
uh, it is a really big story. Like he kept moving from place to place, place to place, place to place. He was in hidden places so that he can start translating and he kept it as a secret in himself. But once he decided, uh, let me go to Germany, Germany. So I'll, I'll have the freedom. I'll have the freedom to print. I'll have the freedom to translate. So he decided and he went to Germany. But one thing that really shocked him was while he was on the way to Germany, there was one person uh, who actually translated, uh, I mean, in William's own place, it was not in Germany, uh, but in William's own place, there was one person uh, who translated the Lord's Prayer and he wrote it in a very small paper and he had it in his hand, but he was burnt alive while he was on his way to Germany. William came to know this, but he still don't want to give up. No matter what happens, he wants to translate. So he started uh, printing as soon as he went to Germany, he went to the print shop, uh, he started printing uh, almost 6,000 6, Bibles he translated and he sent to Britain uh, secretly through ships and secretly. Everything was secret because if someone found out there's a Bible in English, they are sure going to get into some punishment. But while William was about printing the last copies, there was someone called Cohelius. He started raiding that print shop. So because he was against Martin Luther, even in Germany, there are some people who are against this. So William didn't know about him, but somehow he came to knew that he's coming against him. So he flew to a city called Worms. So almost his life was like uh, going from place to place, place to place, and place to place uh, in 1526, 1526, uh, he printed the very first Bible. Uh, so he kept sending things to England he, secretly, even though he knew that it's against law. He kept sending things to England because he was so passionate about this, because he wanted people to know about it. So once the Bishop of London, Tunsil, came to know that there are people who are having these Bibles that translated in English, they are in uh, secret places. So he, what he did was he burned all of the Bible in, uh, in front of a church. And the most funniest thing is while the Bibles were burning, he was actually preaching. He was preaching to the people like you should not do this. And he was preaching about Jesus, but he was burning the Bibles. So that is the most funniest thing for me. Like how can someone burn the word and preach the word? I don't know. but Still, William Tyndale didn't give up. Uh, he kept printing no matter where he went. Um, I think, um, and then he almost uh, completed the New Testament. So he thought of uh, translating uh, the Old Testament. So he learned Hebrew. And then uh, he literally really learned Hebrew. Uh, like he had this great talent in him to learn languages, like in proper grammar even. So he uh, translated the first by five books, the Pentateuch. Uh, by staying in Belgian seacoast, uh, it was like a place, uh, they call it merchant's place. Like many people live there. He wanted protection. So he don't want to live alone, don't want people to recognize him. So like group of people were living in that place. Uh, so he wrote, uh, he was there writing all these uh, things and started printing things in 1534 he did. And one thing that happened, that actually kind of seemed good was King Henry uh, had a second queen called Annie Boleyn and she loved this Bible. She started reading this Bible and she also told King Henry like, I have this Bible and look at these, the translations are good, uh, the words are so powerful and everything. So King Henry wanted William on his court in England. King Henry was not against the Bible in that moment, he was like, I want him to be in my court. He's so uh, talented. So I want him in my court. So he sent Stephen Wake and uh, asked him to find William because William is hiding actually in a place where many people are living. So he's actually hiding. So he went, uh, found William and he was like, uh, King Henry wants you in his court. But William said, I have one thing, one thing. Ask him to authorize English translation. If he says Bible can be translated in English, like everyone can get it, then I will for sure come to the court. But this actually tensed William Henry. Like he was like, why? I sent someone, I asked someone to search for him. I am the king. How can he say no to me? 
So this actually made him tense. So he sent uh, Henry Phillips. Uh, Henry Phillips to actually get caught of uh, William. So during this time, William didn't give up. The thing is, William didn't give up no matter what happened. He started writing Joshua to Chronicles handwritten during those times while waiting for uh, King Henry's reply. Uh, and then Henry Phillips, he came uh, searching for William. He was very tricky. He entered as William's friend. He started searching and he was like, I'm William's friend. I want to have a lunch with you. That's how he uh, invited William Tyndall. William should not come out of that place because if he comes out, people will know and just arrest him. But unfortunately, he believed in this friendship. So he came out. As soon as he came out, the Roman citizens, the Roman uh, soldiers, they caught him up. Uh, and yeah, and then they caught him up. They got him to King Henry. And William was died on October 6, 1536. They burnt him alive. Uh, even at the last moment, he was praying for England, like, God, I pray that these people's eyes will be open. Like, they can see that your word is important. And what happened after William's death is also so inspiring. His friend, known as John Rogers, he translated the whole Bible. The remaining passages also he translated and he made it as a whole book. And 10 months after uh, his death, the same king, King Henry, he authorized the Bibles in English. It's so inspiring. Like, uh, you, it is one thing that I loved is he printed it so small, like it was like a pocket Bible, like 8,000, 20,000 copies. He made everything was so small as pocket Bibles so that no one. No one will know that we have a Bible. And then it was finally authorized. Today we have uh, many translations in Bible. Today we are so blessed. Uh, I think I have like seven to eight translations in my home. And we have different Bibles, study Bibles, journaling Bibles, Bible for kids, Bible for teens. And I think we have a million reasons to be thankful to God, to not to worry and to just praise Him. And we must be thankful for God sending people like William Tyndale because he gave his whole life just to translate Bible, just to take it in English. So we must be thankful. And just like William Tyndale, we should be passionate about the words. These words are not just words. Really, they are not just words. They are more valuable. Many people have sacrificed their life for this word. So it's our responsibility. And we should really decide and desire to go read this word, get deeper into this, and keep trusting on this, because these are not just words, these are powerful words of God. So just like William Tyndale, let us also uh, give our whole life to Jesus and be passionate about it, no matter what happens around, because when God is for us, who can be against you? So thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Jeffy. No, that was wonderful. Thank you also for the presentation it was wonderfully shared and presented thank you Pastor. yeah thank you god bless okay the next person we have is mr isaac if you're ready on john calvin <clears throat> we can go with that yes good morning good morning brother okay i'm um, sorry i prepared my excerpt on a uh, Google Notes. Um, I don't know how to share it, but I have it and I, I will do the presentation orally and later on I will forward it to you. Sure, sure. No problem. You can go ahead with the presentation, please. Okay, thank I you. I mean, with your, with your session, yeah. Okay. Um, this presentation is about John Calvin. John Calvin was a French lawyer theologian, a pastor, and an ecclesiastical statesman. He was the most important figure in the second generation of the Protestant Reformation. He worked in Geneva during the Protestant Reformation. He was born on July 10, 1509, in New York a town in Picardy, a province of France, the second of three children who survived childhood. His parents were Jane and Gerald Calvin. 
he was married to Idileti Calvin from 1540 to 1549, the widow of a man he had converted. John Calvin was raised in a stunned Roman Catholic family. His father was employed by the local bishop as an administrator in the town's cathedral. His father wanted him to become a priest because of his close ties with the bishop and his noble family. At the age of 14, Calvin went to Paris to study at the College of Marche in preparation for his university studies. Towards the end of 1523, he transferred to the more famous College of Montego. Although the teachings of individuals like Luther, Martin Luther and Jacques the Staples were spreading in Paris, Calvin remained closely tied to the Roman Catholic. However, John Calvin in 1525 developed friendship with individuals who were reform-minded. This eventually the stage for Calvin's eventual shift to the reformed faith. While studying in Orleans, in the University of Orleans, his father died in 1531 and he buried his father. While attending to his studies in the universities of France, he read a lot from Erasmus and Martin Luther. It was through their writings he became converted to become a true follower of Christ. By 1532, John Calvin finished his civil law studies and also published his first book, a commentary on the Clementia, an essay on clemency by a Roman philosopher, Sinaka. The following year, Calvin fled Paris because, his, because of his contacts, their lectures, and their writings seems opposed to the Roman Catholic. He spent the next three years in various places under various names outside France. He studied a lot on his own, preached, and began work on his first edition of the Institute. At the age of 26, Calvin published the Institute which became an instant bestseller. The Institute of the Christian Religion is Calvin's seminal work of systematic theology. It is regarded as one of the most influential works of the Protestant theology, published in Latin in 1536 and in its native French in 1541. It's a core reference for the system of, system of doctrine adopted by the Reformed churches, usually called Calvinism. By 1536, Calvin has disengaged or was disengaged from the Roman Catholic Church and made plans to permanently leave France. But because of the war between Francis I and Charles V, was that Charles V or the tenth? I don't get that clear anyway. He, he made a stop in Geneva. His fame has spread so far ahead of him in Geneva that the local bishop, Guglielmo Ferral, persuaded him to stay. Farrell was struggling to plant Protestantism in the city. This started a long, difficult, yet fruitful relationship with that city. Calvin began as a lecturer and a preacher. By 1538, he and Farrell were asked to leave the city by the council because of escalating theological conflicts and their uncompromising religious stand. He went to Strasbourg until 1541. He, st he stayed there as a pastor to French refugees, was peaceful and happy. In Strasbourg, he, lo he learned a lot about the administration of Urban Church from Martin Boucher, his senior pastor. 
1541, the Council of Geneva requested him to return. He was emotionally not happy to return. He wanted to stay in Strasbourg. However, he felt it a responsibility to return to Geneva. Calvin published many volumes of commentaries on most of the books of both the Old and the New Testament, except few, which he omitted. Calvin was instrumental in the establishment of the College de Geneva, which later on became College Calvin, one of the oldest public schools in Geneva, Switzerland. Calvin believed in Calvin's belief was centered around the sovereignty of God. Calvin thought that God had power and absolute supremacy over all things that he created. Calvin thought that God is so holy and so worthy that he should be praised and loved. So man was created so that all God's tributes might be displayed, known, and praised. The, let, the last days, in the last days of Calvin, in the late 1558, Calvin became ill with fever. Afraid of dying before completing the final edition of the Institute, he forced himself to walk. He improved it from 21 chapters to 80. Shortly after he recovered, he strained his voice while preaching, which brought a violent fit of cough that burst a vessel in his lungs. His cell deteriorated considerably. And on the 25th of April, 1564, he made his will in which he left a small amount of money to his family. Few days later, Ministers came to visit him, and he said, or he paid his last goodbye. Calvin passed away on the 27th of May, 1564, at the age of 54. That's all I got for now. And like I said, please show me so that I can forward it to you. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Isaac. God bless. You shared well. Yes, you can share. Uh, you can share on the Google Drive. I will create an assignment as usual, how we create on Google Classwork. So that's where you can upload your PPT presentation along with the research word doc. OK, yeah. So the next person after Mr. Isaac would be Roslyn. Roslyn, if you're ready with John Knox, can we start? Yes, ma'am. Ma and before we could start, Roslyn, one second. Enoch, there would be a change of topic for you because George Fox has already been taken by Zelitoli. Request you to please, you know, uh, take up on Jonathan Edwards. Would that be OK? Enoch, if you have heard me, you can you can reply on chat. Okay, he's left and rejoined. Okay, okay, we will go ahead with uh, Roslyn. For others, you can look up to your chat to get the topics. Aradhana, Elisha. Okay, okay, please go ahead, Roslyn. So I can stop sharing. Do you have a presentation to share, Roslyn? Mm, sorry, ma'am, I don't know how to present. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I just written it in my book, so okay. I need to read it out. Okay, so maybe later for those, uh, for those who have not prepared the presentation, that is the PPT slide. Request you all to please prepare and upload upload it directly on the Google Classwork. Is that okay? I will learn now. OK, OK, great. Uh, yeah, Ruslan, uh, you can get in touch with us if you wanted any help. OK, we will guide you. So right now, 
Sid, uh, Sid Kenu for any help whenever I need. Okay, we have Jeffina also here available. Yeah. He can assist you. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. I'll text her also. Jeffina, is that okay with you? Would you help Roslyn? I I uh, text uh, I texted Jeffina also the other day for some information. So I'll do that. I'll learn from yes. her. Yes. Sure. 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 Thanks. So I've written yes. it in book, so I'll just read it out. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for this uh, opportunity. Um, I'm presenting John Knox, uh, Scotland's greatest reformer. Ma'am, excuse me for the noise. Uh, John Knox was a 16th century Scottish minister. He was uh, born in Gifford Gate in Haddington, East Lothian, in the United Kingdom. He was a reformed theologian and writer. He was also a leader of the country's reformation. Uh, he was the founder. He was the founder of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. Uh, his father, William Knox, was a merchant. Um, mother's name is Sinclair, who died when John Knox was a child. His elder brother, William Knox, took over his father's business. John Knox studied at the University of St. Andrews uh, under John Major, one of the greatest scholars of the Bible of the time. John Knox was ordained a Catholic priest in Edinburgh in the year 1536 by William Hisham, Bishop of Dunblane. However, John Knox was converted from Catholic priest to the Protestant faith um, uh, John Knox joined the reformers Patrick Hamilton and George Wishart, uh, although both uh, died as martyrs for Jesus Christ, uh, for, the, for their faith. Uh, John Knox was, uh, in the year 1549, he was also prisoned for 19 months in the galley prison. Uh, he was released in a very uncertain manner. Uh, his release... On his release, Knox took refuge in England. Uh, in this same year, uh, on 7 April 1549, Knox was, uh, he was licensed to work in the Church of England. Mm. Knox, uh, the liturgy required worshippers to kneel during uh, communion. Knox considered this as idolatry. Uh, he was protesting the um, Catholic mass and worship. His preaching and work of reformation was carried on in Scotland. The bishops of Scotland viewed, uh, viewed him as a threat to their authority and summoned him to appear in Edinburgh on May 1556. Uh, he was accompanied um, by so many... Um, uh, uh, he was accompanied by so many influential persons that the bishop decided to call the hearing off and uh, John Knox was set free to preach openly in Edinburgh on August 1st the Scottish Parliament met to settle religious issues Knox and five other ministers were called to draw up a new confession of faith. The parliament passed three acts in one day, abolished the jurisdiction of the Pope in Scotland. It condemned all doctrine and practice contrary to the reformed faith. Uh, it forbade the celebration of mass in Scotland. Um, to conclude, like. Um, more than anything else, uh, John Knox was uh, known for his prayers. Give me Scotland or I die. Knox's prayer uh, was not an arrogant demand, but passionate plea of a man willing to die for the sake of pure preaching of the gospel in the salvation of his countrymen. And this uh, prayer has really blessed me as I was doing this um, study on John Knox. 
uh, Knox's greatness uh, lay his humble dependence on his God to revive his nation and reform his church. Uh, Knox's belief was not in the power of his prayer or power of his preaching, but in the power of the gospel and power of God. Uh, preaching and prayer is always a second uh, was always a secondary means in the salvation of his people. Um, John Knox continued his work as a reformer. He was called as a trumpeter of Scotland because of his preaching with conviction. He was called to minister. Minist he was called to um, a, a minister in his early. 40s, he was called to ministry in his early 40s. Uh, he was a brilliant scholar, uh, came a little late uh, in the ministry, yet his preachings uh, gets immediate recognition. Uh, King Edward VI appointed him to be as one of his royal chaplain who went throughout England preaching reformed truths. John Knox was a God-fearing man, a man of prayer, and his prayers threatened the Queen of Scotland. He feared not the face of any man. He was known for his boldness as he stood in the pulpit because he feared only his God. John Knox said, quote, whatever influenced me to utter whatever the Lord put in my mouth so boldly and without respect of persons was a reverential fear of my God, unquote. Because he feared God so much, he feared man so little. This holy fear thrust him forward in his preachings. He said, uh, I knew I rendered an account before the judgment throne. As we read in Paul, uh, Paul's epistle to 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 10. I will read that. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We Christians shall all stand before the judgment seat to give an account of what we did and how we did. Verse 11 says, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Praise God. It is the fear of the last day and our giving an account to believers as believers to Jesus Christ the deeds done in our bodies, whether good or bad, that drove John Knox to preach with great boldness. He was so bold in his preachings to call out things as they truly are in a time it was desperately needed to be heard. He took the word of God so seriously. He took his ministry so seriously. He took the last day when he shall stand before the Lord so seriously that it gripped his heart and made him sober-minded. As Bible also tells us to be sober-minded, to be level-headed in our ministry, to not to be intoxicated with the spirit of this age, but to remain very level-headed in our ministry so as we preach the word of God. So... Uh, that's it, ma'am. Uh, he died um, on 24th November 1572 in Edinburgh. Uh, we really praise God for such an uh, anointed man of God that he, <clears throat> that we had. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rosalind. Wonderfully shared. Thank you, each one, for taking this time and sharing on the assigned topic. OK, um, so there are some changes on George Fox. We already have assigned to Zelatoli. So Jonathan Edwards would be 
Texas Enoch and George Whitefield will be super fish and then we have who's the other person Lyndon right Lyndon yes ma'am okay George Whitefield was assigned to you but uh, whom did Subhashish talk on George Whitefield? Okay, okay. So, Lyndon, I'll just give you a different person. Um, uh, can you talk about... Um, okay, let's skip. Okay. Jonathan Wesley, Lyndon? Okay. Okay. So Lyndon will talk about Jonathan Wesley. Um, I'm just going to the list. Elisha, would you like to choose a, choose a person from the notes? Abu Bakr, Elisha, Aradhana. Yes, ma'am. I'm ready to pick the next person. Yeah, Mr. Abubakar, on whom you would be talking on? I'm going to talk on uh, David Bernard. David Bernard, okay, done. Okay, okay. Elisha? Um, Inesha, would be would you take up the second great awakening or any individual person? I'll give it to you. Just give me a minute. I'll assign a person. George Whitefield. This revival, David Bird. Mm. William Carey. Lasha, is that topic okay with you? Aradhana? Aradhana, would you pick Henry Martin? Okay. okay. Okay, I think most of us are covered in the class, right? Okay, so we have covered most of them. Okay, okay, then thank you so much. The next class, kindly prepare a presentation and a, a research doc, and you can present it in the class. Okay. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you all. And the, each one had put in the effort to share on the topics that was assigned. Thank you. See you all in the next class. God bless. Yeah. Thank you.